Galur Eilode i Trevan, a kin Kachwinka Domino, Brivin Nawith Thai Baub, a Kevi di Groisawi Eilod Nawith in Pleath, Bandi Jones, Egan Rachioli, Panbarth the Gogleth, and Dylan and this with Yad Nathan Gill, a Gay Domino, and Tha, Imandi Jones, Utfidi, and Gamred Igwaith, Ama and a Kanishiad. Vesli Arhani, question Ir Privini Dog, question Kunta Joyce Watson. Uh, dear Llywydd, will the First Minister make a statement on efforts to recycle plastic in Wales? Yes, we've set high targets for recycling in Wales, including uh, plastic. All local authorities collect plastic for recycling, and businesses will be further encouraged to do so under the Environment Act provisions. And in addition, we're working with the industry to increase treatment capacity for plastics which are collected. Uh, you will be aware, uh, First Minister, that last week China made an announcement that they'll no longer be importing plastic waste from the UK. And last year alone, uh, Wales exported over 4,000 tonnes. So, and we know also that the amount of plastic produced and disposed of is growing every single year. And the uh, majority of that is single-use uh, plastic for wrapping up food. So could we take this as an opportunity, maybe here in Wales, to do two things? One, to reduce the amount of single-use plastic in the very first place, yeah. and secondly, uh, where that's not possible, so th where, that we can actually recycle our own <laughs> plastic, and there are some very good examples of people doing that here in Wales, and grow those industries. Yes, there are two things to address here. Firstly, we've commissioned a study to assess the feasibility of an extended producer responsibility scheme for food and drink packaging, including disposable plastic. That will report in February. We're also considering a tax or uh, levy on disposable plastic. But there are great opportunities here uh, for Welsh businesses to look at uh, uh, how they can get involved in the plastics recycling uh, industry. We are working, for example, with JPLAS to help it identify suitable sites to base plants in Wales. And JPLAS is the UK market leader in post-consumer recycling, including rigid plastics recycling. Russell George. Yeah, yeah. George Farrell, um, well, I think there is universal agreement that China's decision uh, will pose a big challenge to us in regards to uh, recycling here in Wales in regards to plastics. Uh, by commissioning a recycling technologies plant, uh, which would turn end-of-life plastics, such as uh, light oil, wax, or uh, low sulphur heavy fuel oil, um, we could create an ideal um, resource here for a wide range of industry uh, applications. And this course could, of course, be an opportunity for, for Wales. Uh, would you agree that it's now time that we end the present system of burning plastics and sending uh, our plastics to landfill and be the first country uh, to treat its own plastic waste in a totally uh, environmentally friendly way? Yeah. Yes, I do. And I think it's hugely important to work, as I mentioned earlier, with companies who have proven expertise uh, in this area uh, to make sure that uh, more plastic is recycled within Wales and more jobs created as a result. And, of course, to uh, look to see how we can assist those new entrants to the market. Simon Thomas. Uh, well, just for length, right, or might a problem, and I have group Spuriel, Llangatog and Powys wedi canfod ym is hydref y llynedd, wrth casglu Spuriel <coughs> just yn ar adal y pentre Llangatog, oedd yn wedi canfod 206 o gwpana coffee wedi tuli uh, bant jes fel na. Does dim angen uh, lefi latte uh, yng Nghymru, achos mae gyda chi fel eich unigwaid, cynllun posib a gyfer lefi a plastic un defnydd fel un o pedraidd uh, treth newydd dych chi'n ystyried. Pryd felly gawn ni glywed uh, pa dreth i chi wedi uh, uh, penderfynu anno, ac a'i gai anog chi am y tola efallai i manteisio ar uh, y mwymiad Plaid Cymru a rai o mae'n cyrchefn chi, dwi'n meddwl, a gwneud yn siŵr mae'r treth cyntaf yw lefi a blastig i'n defnydd. Well, fe'n si, uh, y peth cyntaf yw sicrhau bod y rydroddiad ynglyn a uh, chyfrifoldeb uh, cynhyrchwyr uh, ynglyn a uh, pecynnau uh, bwyd a diod, bod y uh, hwnna, <coughs> rydroddiad hwnna yn cael ei gyhoeddi, bydd hwnna yn cael ei gyhoeddi ym mis chwefror. Unwaith, wrth gwrs, bydd hwnna wedi cael ei gyhoeddi, bydd hwnna'n helpu i ni uh, i neud penderfyniad ynglyn ar ffordd ymlaen gyda unrhyw dreth. Question 2, Nick Ramsey. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's policies for supporting enterprise in South East Wales? Well, our plans for economic development are set out in Prosperity for All and the Economic Action Plan. 
and we continue to provide a wide range of support to businesses in Wales through Business Wales and the Development Bank. And we'll also provide infrastructure investment and actions which improve business conditions. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Happy New Year. Uh, yesterday was an historic day for Wales with the nationalisation uh, of the seven bridges, and I'm sure you're welcome, and a reduction in the tolls, a great Gateway Wales project. However, this comes only a few weeks after the Welsh Government's call-in and refusal of a planning application in Monmouth in my constituency for a hotel and spa development. <laughs> another fantastic Gateway, Gateway Wales project. Uh, the concern in the town about this decision has not diminished over the new year. The hotel was rejected on planning grounds due to um, TAN 15 considerations. Can your officials look again at either this decision or failing that, look again at the TAN 15 guidelines? Because it does seem to be that this has been overzealously applied and I'm concerned that it is starting to stifle economic opportunities across Wales, which otherwise would benefit the Welsh economy. Well, TAN 15, the Minister tells me, is being uh, looked at. Uh, I can't comment, of course, on an individual planning uh, application. I mean, he mentions the, uh, the seven tolls, but let's not get too overexcited about this. Uh, of course, I very much welcome the return of the seven bridges to public ownership. What the UK government have actually done is to remove the VAT, which they cannot legally charge anyway, uh, on the tolls because they're coming back into public ownership. So yes, as far as the public are concerned, of course it's a reduction in the tolls, but let's not pretend this is some great concession by the UK government because they can't actually charge the 20% in the first place. What would be far better is if they got rid of the tolls altogether. Uh, First Minister, can I, can I welcome very much the Welsh Government's financial support for e-cycle in my constituency? Remember, as the former Remploy plant, the Welsh Government helped survive and transform into uh, e-cycling. And, in fact, the further package of uh, funding that enables to continue to expand and to develop, creating not only business but, obviously, jobs within the Valley's areas. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister, if you can actually comment on the, uh, the company, its potential for growth, the actual details of the support that is actually being given to that company, and particularly the fact that it is an ethical company employing disabled workers, uh, many of whom are from my constituency, it's based in my constituency, but it's a real example of Welsh Government is doing to actually uh, support this type of business with real potential for expansion in the valleys. Well, it's true to say, of course, the eCycle have been uh, awarded support, and I'm pleased we are providing support to, uh, to eCycle. We will continue to assist the uh, company in identifying new opportunities for business uh, growth. And both the recently published Economic Action Plan and the Valley's Task Force Delivery Plan both recognise the impact of digital technology and set out our proposals to future-proof the Welsh economy. Stefan Lewis. Yeah. I very much welcome yesterday's announcement by the Welsh Government to create a £50 million Brexit preparedness fund, something that will be essential for enterprise support in the South East and across the country. And I very much hope the Welsh Government has looked at the Irish models for support as we face separation from the European Union and the great economic uncertainty that is bound to uh, entail as Theresa May continues her Brexit shambles. What assurances can the First Minister give enterprises across the country, and particularly in the South East, that this will be an accessible, straightforward fund that they will find simple to engage with and that it will be targeted and that they can deliver on its very good intentions indeed? Can I say what a pleasure it is to see the member here? And he, will, he will hear from the reception that he has received. Uh, the goodwill of this chamber and the, the, the friendship that he enjoys amongst many in this chamber across parties. Uh, in relation to his question, the announcement yesterday uh, was an announcement that indicates to uh, businesses, to universities and others that we are putting money aside in order to help them to deal with the consequences of Brexit. What we don't know, of course, is what Brexit will look like uh, and so much of the detail has yet to be uh, to be looked at. But we will work with all those affected to put in place an effective and simple scheme to ensure that the scheme provides the support that it's intended to provide. Christina Naurgan Arwen, where a play dear, when is Ruthfled and Ruati Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, could I also extend a welcome to the new member here today and endorse the First Minister's comments about how welcome it is to see Stefan back in the chamber here and wish him well in the weeks and months ahead that he has. Uh, and I'd also offer my congratulations to David Melding, who was recognised in the New Year's Honours list, uh, a very worthy contribution to Welsh democracy uh, and has been recognised by the New Year's Honours uh, 
list that was put out this year. Uh, First Minister, we've all seen the pressures that have hit the Welsh NHS over the last couple of weeks, and especially those specific winter pressures. Were they predictable and were they preventable? Well, first of all, could I pay tribute to all our staff in all settings, the GPs, the paramedics, hospitals and social care for their remarkable efforts in responding to these pressures. The winter is always a very challenging period. There will always be times when demand places our services under great pressure, uh, needing local escalation. There was rigorous preparation in place, uh, but the NHS in Wales has been under considerable pressure, consistent with that being reported in other parts of the UK. There was a professional response, more resources were made available, uh, and the situation is now stabilising. Thank you, First Minister, for that answer. I do recognise that there are pressures across the whole of the United Kingdom, as we have all seen in the news. Uh, my first question was, were they predictable and were they preventable, some of the pressures unique to Wales, uh, such as no GP out of hours service, uh, as I am led to believe here in Cardiff over the festive period. Uh, there was chronic waiting times over and above what we have seen in other parts of the NHS in the United Kingdom, especially Glancluid, for example. Less than 50 per cent of patients who presented at A&E were seen within the government's own four-hour wait wait times, and we already knew that wait times were excessive here in Wales as opposed to other parts of the United Kingdom. Now, you and I can have a political ding-dong about this, and it won't really advance the argument that much further. What people want to hear is what solutions the government will be putting into place to stop some of these unique events that have been happening in Wales that are specific to Wales, such as no out-of-hours provision whatsoever here in the capital city of Cardiff, and above all, those really long waits in A&Es across A&E departments in Wales, such as I highlighted to you. What are you doing? Well, first of all, in terms of A&E, it's not the case that the target is four hours before somebody is seen in A&E. The target is four hours until somebody is discharged or admitted from A&E. So just to make that clear. Uh, he asks the question uh, fairly, uh, was this predictable? The answer to my mind is, is no, and I'll explain why. For example, when it came to red ambulance calls, the figure for New Year's Eve was 54% higher than New Year's Eve last year. Similar figures, though lower, were reported for uh, New Year's Day and also for the Christmas period. Now, is that predictable? I'd argue it isn't. Nevertheless, a great deal of planning went into ensuring that the NHS was able to, to manage. There were great pressures. I pay tribute to uh, staff. And, of course, as I say, the situation is now uh, stabilising. But we will be looking at why it is that there was such a spike uh, on New Year's Eve, for example, just to give one example, compared to last year. And despite the great pressure that was placed on the health service, staff were still able to work hard to reach the, the, the targets that we have set, particularly the paramedic staff. Why it is that there's a spike like that compared with last year is something we have to look at. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, I too pay tribute to all the staff who were out over the festive period, while many of us were enjoying the festive period, and without our staff, our NHS would not work in whatever section of the service they work in. But the point I made in my second contribution this afternoon, that if there is no out-of-hours provision whatsoever, then it's obvious that the ambulance service, for example, is going to see a spike in uh, demand for its services. And so what I ask of you in my third question to you is will we be in the same position this time next year or what measures will you be taking specifically to address these pressures which do happen year in year out i do take the point that you've pointed to a specific spike in the ambulance calls that were put in on new year's eve but we are seeing little or no availability in some areas for out of hours provisions we are seeing continuing demand for a and e provision and obviously we are seeing a lack of bed space within our hospitals 30% of beds have been lost since 1997 here in Wales. So there does need to be a review of how the government and the health boards respond to this crisis. And what we need to hear is when that re will, review will be undertaken and can we really expect that this situation won't be replicated next year? Well, of course, the review has been undertaken in the sense that the parliamentary review is due, I understand, to publish its findings very soon. And that will look at ways in which cross-party, which the ways, ways in which the health service can be strengthened. In terms of GP care, it is right to say that in one part of Wales uh, there were problems uh, on two dates. I understand, not in other parts of Wales, but but there was severe pressure, particularly there. He asks the question: uh, Do we need to look at the reason why there were particular spikes this year compared to previous years? The answer is yes. That's something we do want to look at because that will form part of the LHB's. Uh, preparedness for next uh, winter. 
So in terms of is it preventable, well, there's always pressure on the NHS this time of year. There's always planning in order to, uh, to look to, uh, to deal with that pressure. Predictable? No, I don't think so, given the figures that we've seen uh, on more than one date over the uh, holiday uh, period, when there was a significant increase uh, in uh, demand for ambulance calls, particularly uh, compared to the previous year. And when is Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood? Diolch, I'm going to continue with Health First Minister. You said that winter pressures are expected every year, and you're right, and you should be planning for spikes in demand as well every year. Can you honestly say that you believe that the health service has performed well over the winter in dealing with those pressures and spikes? Yes, I do. I think the NHS staff have performed uh, heroically and magnificently over the course of the, uh, of the winter. Uh, GPs, of course, they are often uh, in the front line. Uh, they have worked very hard. Paramedics, incredible, uh, given the fact that they have responded so well to uh, emergency calls, despite the enormous spike in those uh, calls, and of course, hospitals and, and those who work in the social care uh, sector. They, they continue to maintain an NHS of enormous scale that receives tens of thousands of contacts and calls uh, every, every year. There was, of course, a visible peak of pressure into the new year, and there were real challenges, but it's, uh, it is now pleasing to see a much improved and stable uh, position that was reported at the end of last week. First Minister, the story that you tell is of a, a service that's under pressure but coping well. But there's another story uh, as well, and that's been told by the media, of hospitals being, and I quote, like a battlefield for NHS staff. Now, both of those stories can't be true, and I think that you know that winter preparations have not been good enough. Isn't that why we had an apology from Vaughan Gethin for cancelled operations? Isn't that why we are hearing the claim from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine that patient safety is being compromised daily and that the solution is more capacity? The Welsh NHS needs more beds, it needs more nurses and it needs more doctors. £10 million announced over the weekend came with an admission that pressures across the health and social care are above those anticipated. Why do you underestimate these pressures every year? Do you now accept that the Cabinet Secretary was wrong to make the claim in November that the service was in the best position possible to cope with the winter and do you accept that you were wrong to cut the number of hospital beds? Well, first of all, I, I think that the Cabinet Secretary was correct. Uh, nobody could have predicted the kind of figures that we've seen over the course of the, the, uh, uh, the holiday period. I don't think any member in this chamber could possibly have uh, predicted that. She mentions beds, but it's, it's more complicated than that, in my, in my view. It's hugely important, not in terms of looking at beds, but looking in terms of getting people out of hospital when they're ready. And that's why, of course, it's hugely important that we invest in social care, which we have done compared to England, where social care funding has been, has been cut. It is important that people are able to leave hospital when they are able to do so and they have the right support to do so. So it's not simply a question of number of beds, it's a question of making sure that people are able to leave hospital when they can. You have an 85% target for hospital beds, and you breach that as a matter of routine, which means that patients' safety is compromised. You are failing to meet that measure of patient safety, and that is unacceptable. And First Minister, I have to say, I think you're being complacent. It's not just us, it's the Royal College of Emergency Medicine is also saying that the NHS staffing needs to be increased, and it's in your gift to do that. Without nurses, without doctors and without specialists, there would be no NHS. Now, we've heard a lot of warm words over the Christmas period from politicians supporting frontline NHS staff, and you've just made a tribute to yourself. If you really want to support frontline NHS staff, then, First Minister, pay them properly. The pay cap means that nurses are still underpaid, and it's in your gift to lift that pay cap. Workforce planning is one of the most important tools that you have at your disposal, yet you won't embrace the need for a new medical uh, training school in the north. No Westminster government will do this for us. It's, Labour government. it's your Labour government's responsibility. A cabinet uh, secretary, a Labour cabinet secretary, has now admitted responsibility for the lack of planning ahead of the winter pressures. 
It's time, First Minister, now that you did the same. Given that apology from the Health Secretary, will you now accept responsibility for failing to train enough doctors for the Welsh NHS? Far from it. We see that the recruitment campaign that we have uh, put in place has been very successful in recruiting doctors. You can't recruit doctors at the drop of a drop of hand, particularly training. A&E specialists. Training. And it's hugely important that uh, we have training facilities in place, but it's hugely important that the right professional uh, <laughs> atmosphere is in place to, to, to retain doctors and to attract them in the first place. It's not all about uh, training people simply in Wales. We're not medical autarky. Secondly, it is hugely important to, to understand that, that I believe the Cabinet Secretary and the local health have done their planning. If we look at the, uh, the, the spike in uh, demand that we saw, nobody could have uh, predicted that spike in demand. And I have to say to her, I do not accept that we should allow the UK government off the hook when it comes to the pay cap. Why on earth should the people of Wales have to fund the failure of a UK government to lift the pay cap? How can we justify to the people who vote for us that we should pay for something that the UK government should be paying for? I agree with her. I think the pay cap should be lifted. But why should the people of Wales have to pay for it when, the people, when it's the UK government have the responsibility to do it? An increase in pay in the health service carries a price tag of hundreds of millions of pounds. Where does the money come from? If we are to do that, then it means money coming out of the budget somewhere else. I don't disagree with her. I agree with her on the pay cap. She, she and I are in the same position. But I cannot agree with her that somehow we should fill in a gap that the UK government itself has actually created. Let the Tories pay so to ensure the people of Wales are able to pay the staff of the NHS properly. Can I start on a note of amity? which will certainly not continue, but at least at the very beginning of the proceedings, and wish uh, the First Minister, indeed all his ministers, uh, a happy new year. And I do genuinely wish them success, although I think it's unlikely to be realised. Uh, and uh, and uh, can I return to the point which was raised by Stefan Lewis earlier on, and I'm sure everybody would agree with this too, say that it's actually an inspiration to us all for him to be here today, and if it's not too frightening a prospect, I'm right behind him in his battle against uh, his, uh, his uh, terrible disease. But uh, uh, I welcome the, uh, um, the, the transition fund, which the uh, um, First Minister has announced, uh, but does he not agree with me that that would be far more effective if the Welsh Government weren't so relentlessly pessimistic about the opportunities presented by Brexit? And can I ask him in 2018 for a change of approach? to this opportunity for the whole of Britain. And if he's more positive and uplifting about the future, then Welsh businesses themselves will have more confidence in the future and investment will increase and we will all be better off. Uh, well, first of all, can I wish him all the best as well uh, and say to him, I, I, I congratulate him on the temporary expansion of his group. Uh, we know it didn't last very long, but uh, there we are, back to the, uh, back to the famous five. Uh, in terms of the EU uh, fund, Businesses are saying to us that they're worried about Brexit. They're worried about the nature of the trading relationship with Europe. That's their major market, and why should it not be? More than 60% of our exports go there. More than 90% of our food and drink exports go there. It's fantasy to suggest that somehow a new market or markets would appear by next year in order to mop up all these exports. If we cannot get right our relationship with our nearest, biggest market, what hope have we got? of conducting any kind of agreement with any other market or nation. So that has to be done first. Now, we don't know what Brexit will look like. Very good to see the UK government is moving towards our ground compared to where they were last year. The last year, they weren't going to pay for any uh, uh, kind of uh, financial deal. They weren't interested in EU citizens. They weren't talking about a transitional period. They've done all that. We welcome the fact that they've, they've moved towards the light uh, in that sense. But I have to say to the member, it's important to be realistic and not be, uh, and be a fantasist when it comes to, to Brexit. In the referendum, we were told time and time again by members of his own party, there will be a trade deal. We can be like Norway. Now we're hearing, well, don't worry about a trade deal. Well, businesses are worried about the lack of a trade deal. Well, can I respond to the uh, First Minister Sally uh, to, uh, about uh, our temporary expansion of our, of our group? That UKIP has done a great deal since the beginning of the year to entertain the country and uh, cheer us all up. Uh, but uh, we, we, we are here uh, to fight for what we believe in, and, uh, uh, and uh, we will continue the fight as we have done in the last year with a group of five. But one of the opportunities which the uh, 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 Brexit offers to us if we are not part of the single market is that we then 
secure control of regulation. And he'll have seen that last week the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive uh, came into force uh, throughout the whole of the EU. I mean, this is 7,000 pages long. It contains 1.4 million paragraphs. It's six times the size of the Bible. And it will require all financial firms that deal in shares, bonds, derivatives, indeed all financial instruments, <coughs> to acquire a huge mass of uh, documentation <coughs> which they'll then have to publish and preserve for five years, imposing mammoth costs on uh, financial services firms. If we're outside the single market, uh, we can slim down <coughs> that burden of regulation without any danger to the public at all. And Dublin has made a great success out of uh, expansion of its financial services businesses by having a tax advantage by reducing corporation tax. Does the First Minister agree with me that Cardiff, as a developing financial centre, could greatly benefit by a slimmed down financial regulation system whilst properly preserving the public interest. The 10% of people who work in Cardiff are in financial and professional services. They contribute 1.2 billion a year in GVA, and indeed in Wales as a whole, 3 billion. So, will the First Minister agree with me that it would be a good thing if he were to look to having proportionate regulation in the financial services sector as a means of kick starting the financial services industry here in Wales? Well, of course, I mean, first of all, I don't begrudge uh, his party's ability to provide us with entertainment, uh, as, he, uh, as he rightly pointed out. But turning to the points that he makes, I mean, first of all, the, these issues are not devolved, uh, as he knows. But in terms of the principle of it, I don't agree with him that the point of Brexit is wholesale deregulation. Mm. Our financial services sector will still have to operate in the European market. If it doesn't follow the rules of the European market, it won't be able to operate there. Uh, and that will have enormous consequences for jobs, not just in Wales, but also in the rest of the UK, particularly the city, where the city has been a, a, a place where a great deal of European operations have taken place. If, it's, if, it, if the regulations in the UK are substantially different, then people won't come to the UK because they want to operate in the bigger market. Secondly, we have to remember that the financial crash of 2007 was caused, uh, in, at least in great part, by deregulation of financial services and the fact that uh, an opportunity was given to irresponsible financiers to play around with people's money, to lend to people who had no hope of paying them back, and the financial system collapsed as a result of it. So from my perspective, yes, regulations has to be proportionate, but it has to be there because bluntly, given what we saw in 2007, 2008, there are some who work in the large financial centres in this world who cannot be trusted with other people's money. The First Minister knows that MIFID has nothing to do with the kind of conduct which, uh, <coughs> which caused the crash uh, or made it far worse in 2008. When I remind uh, the First Minister, of course, we had a Labour government and a Labour Chancellor, exchequer, a Labour Prime Minister, who uh, himself wanted a light-touch regulatory system. <coughs> of course, we all learned great lessons from that. <coughs> but <coughs> regulations such as MIFID II, which require this vast amount of, of uh, information, uh, storage and retrieval is far too great for any regulatory body to be able to use effectively. So it's imposing a vast cost upon firms and therefore the public at large ultimately bear the cost of all business taxes <coughs> for no practical benefit to anybody at all. And the result of that is to drive financial services business away from Europe altogether to, to places like New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, so on and so forth. So for Britain, <coughs> there's a great opportunity post-Brexit if we can't do a deal with the EU, and nobody ever guaranteed any kind of trade deal with the EU. Nobody was able to do that. Uh, That's not in our gift to force the EU to enter into a deal with us. We just said it was in their own uh, self-interest, as indeed ours, to come to an agreement. But nobody could force them to do that. But if no such deal is available, then the world out there is much bigger than Europe. 85% of the global economy is outside Europe. Should we not be positive about those opportunities rather than relentlessly negative and saying that the future lies in what is a contracting part of the world economy? Well, the thing is he contradicts himself now because he complains about a directive. In the future, the UK will have no role at all in influencing those directives. The UK will have to accept them or not have access to the European market. So the UK's voice is much diminished now compared to where it, where it was in the past. And secondly, he seems to think the world out there is a world that is open to trade with the UK. Other markets are equally as closed 
Uh, if you look at the US, that is a market that, that does not trade freely with the rest of the world, nor does China, nor does India. Uh, there seems to be this, this thought in some in his party that somehow the world is just waiting to uh, conduct uh, free trade agreements with the UK. That's certainly not the, what other countries are saying, uh, and certainly not what the experience has been in the past. Six or seven years is the average timescale for, for uh, agreeing a free trade agreement. We have in the US a president who puts America first. Does he really think that we will have an equitable free trade agreement with the US uh, with a president who is open uh, about his views on protecting American industry? Will we have, for example, a backdoor TTIP as a result of the trade bill, which forces us to privatise large parts of the uh, public sector, something which we would oppose tooth and nail? But ultimately, as I've said before, we are at present in the single market. I'd like us to stay in the single market or have full and unfettered access to the single market. We already have a great deal of convergence with it. If we cannot agree a deal with a market where we have so much in common to begin with, we have no chance of agreeing a deal with other markets that are much, much different, with different regulations uh, that we would then have to try to, to harmonise. The European market is our biggest market. It's on our doorstep. We have a land border with it. We export 60% of our exports to it. We cannot allow our policy on the European single market to be blinded by ridiculous nationalist nonsense. Gentry <laughs> 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 Yn ffyniant i bawb a'r cynllun gweithredu economaidd, ni yn parhau i ddarparu amrywiaeth o gefnogaeth i fusnesau Cymru drwy yr enghraifft, Busnes Cymru a'r banc uh, datblygu, a hefyd yn besoddi mewn sylwaith ac yn cymryd camau wella yn mod y fusnes. Diolch y fawr am yr uh, atreb yna, prif yn unig. Nawr, yn y tyriol, mae ffigurau GVA diweddara ar ONS yn dangos bod economi Cymru'n parhau i fod yn waith na gweddill y dyn a synedig gyda GVA pen uh, dim ond yn saith eich dau y cant o'r cyfartaledd prydeinig. Mae gennym ni hefyd anghydraddol deb economaidd sylweddol yma yng Nghymru, gyda chastell neudd po Talbot o fewn yn rhanbarth i er enghraifft bron i 10 y cant i slaw cyfartaledd Cymru. Na, mae pobl yn teimlo bod yr ardal yn cael ei esgiliso, a nid ydynt yn argohoeddedig y bydd ymdrechion y fargen dinesig a thasglu'r cymoedd yn cyflawni'r newid economaidd angenrheidiol un Cymuned enwedig yng nghymoedd y sir. Ar eich chi'n cytuno felly bod angen i lywodraeth Cymru a chyngor Castellnedd wneud llawer mwy i sicrhau bod ardaloedd fel cymoedd a bertawau neudd ac afan yn dal i fyny a gweddill Cymru ar dyn a synedig yn economaidd. Well, yn iawn, ond gael ddweud i ddechrau, wrth gwrs, fe wnaeth llywodraeth Cymru o fawr o waith ynglyn â sicrhau dyfodol gwaith dir po Talbot. Uh, na Llywodraeth uh, Dyn Sanedig dim uh, o beth rydw i a llai i weld, ond fe siarad y sy'n llawer gyda Tata uh, yma yng Nghymru a hefyd yn uh, Mumbai a gweithio gyda'r un debyg er mwyn sicrhau dyfodol uh, y gwaith dir. Mae ni gofio blwyddo hynny'r yn ôl, oedd y dyfodol hynny yn, yn edrych yn sigledig dros ben, a gwrth gwrs ni'n gwybod bod y gwaith dir yn talu yn dda uh, yn, yr, yn yr ardal. A gwrth gwrs trwy defnyddio tasglu uh, y cymoedd a hefyd gweithio gyda, gyda'r fargen uh, dinesig, mae'n holl bwysig bod, uh, bod uh, y gwaith yn, yn, yn parhau. Gael ddweud, ma fe'n holl bwysig fod Castellnedd po Talbot yn ystyr ei bod yn rhan o fai abertawau ac yn gweithio gyda chynghorau eraill am y mai abertawau er mwyn sicrhau um, uh, dyfodol economaidd yr ardal yn gyfan gwbl. Susie Davis. Uh, Diolch Llywydd. Um, since I've been an Assembly member, which is the best part of seven years now, Welsh Government has given over £320 million of taxpayers' money towards businesses in Wales, which of course includes uh, South Wales West. Um, by October, just at the end of last year, we heard that less than £7 million of that total has been repaid to date, and even from a, a Welsh Conservative point of view, which uh, you know, embraces uh, calculated risk, um, that's really a pretty poor rate of repayment. Will, I, will the, um, and I quote this, the economic contract between businesses and government uh, referred to in the new economic plan um, include a requirement that all loans are paid in full and on time and contain the relevant provisions uh, for enforcement? Well, yes, but she doesn't say that the loans aren't being paid on time. She says that, that a relatively small percentage have been repaid, which I would expect at this stage anyway, 
uh, in terms of the in terms of the process. Unless she is saying that we demand that loans are paid back in a time period that is not appropriate in terms of job job creation. So, of course, we've always taken the position uh, over the years of ensuring that money is recouped where that can be done. We've taken action to uh, to do that when it comes to grant funding, uh, for example, and we will continue to uh, to do that. And I'm kind of reminded that the, the £60 million package that we put on the table ensured the survival of Tata for Talbot at the time the UK Government did nothing. We asked the UK Government to deal with energy prices. They did nothing about that at all. We asked the UK Government to deal with the issue of pensions. They did nothing about that either. Tata and ourselves worked together to secure the future of the steel industry in Wales as the UK Government stood by and did nothing. David Rees. First Minister, I agree totally with the actions the Welsh Government has taken to support Tata, particularly in my patch, and the failure of the UK Government to actually have done literally nothing. But the question is, I want to expand upon Dai point, I think. The consequence of Tata and losing its workforce has meant that well-paid and skilled jobs have gone. And as we see in, in business industries and businesses coming in, they tend to be more the minimum wage and zero-hour contracts. What are you doing as a Welsh Government to actually encourage jobs into the area which are matching the skills and the pay levels that we are seeing lost. It's done to training for much of it. I mean, first of all, we, the, the economic policy of the late 80s and early 90s was to attract investment into Wales on, based on the fact that we had lower wage rates than anywhere else in Western Europe. Those days, thankfully, are gone. Uh, we now attract investment that is uh, well paid. Uh, we have investors coming into Wales who would never have come here 20 years ago. They wouldn't have seen Wales as a place where they could get the, the skilled uh, well-paid workforce that they that they require and that's why of course uh, we have the, the economic action plan it's why we've put so much emphasis on skills through schemes like uh, jobs growth wales to make sure that our people have the skills they need uh, to earn more uh, when investors come to wales and when they set up their own uh, businesses and that is the answer to my mind of making sure that we see gba per head improve over the next few years question pedwar jane hat Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government action to mark the centenary anniversary of women's suffrage? Well, we'll be fully involved in the UK-wide celebrations of the 100th anniversary of the Representation of the People Act, and more details on how we will mark that centenary throughout the course of this year will be made available this month. Thank the First Minister for that answer. In November 2017, data from the World Economic Forum showed for the first time a year-on-year -year worsening of the gender gap since 2006. In fact, the group predicts that it would uh, take a century to close all areas of equality it monitors globally, well up from the 83 years predicted in 2016. They predict that women will have to wait 217 years before they earn as much as men and are equally <coughs> represented in the workplace. So will you join me in backing Horateg's goal to make Wales the global leader in gender equality with their fair play employer benchmark and embed this in the Welsh Government's economic action plan? Yes, well, we work with businesses, trades unions and others on implementing uh, the plan, the economic action plan, and that will be informed by the advice and recommendations of, a fair, of the Fair Work Board. And because we've asked the Fair Work Board to provide recommendations to us, it wouldn't be appropriate to preempt their findings by committing to uh, what it takes benchmark at this stage, but I do welcome very much Quality's initiative in developing the benchmark, which will help to support organisations to deliver gender equality in the workplace. Jonathan Saunders. Yeah, yeah. 100 years after women obtained the vote, and almost 50 years after the Equal Pay Act, it is outrageous that here in Wales we still have a gender pay differential gap of around 13%. Now, interestingly enough, the highest pay gap in Wales is in your own constituency of Bridge End, where it stands at a staggering 27%. First Minister, what actions are, are you taking or have you taken, uh, perhaps looking at your own constituency, uh, to address this, but more widely across Wales, uh, because you are the First Minister and you are ultimately responsible for ensuring that there is genuine equality across Wales for both men and women? Well, first of all, we introduced a public sector equality duty uh, in 2011 to address pay and employment differences, uh, and specifically gender pay differences at that time. Those duties apply in Wales, they're broad, encompassing sure. the need to understand and address the causes of pay differences for all, uh, for all people. Uh, and improving women's place in the workforce is a long term structural change. We know there's more to do. The members said that, of course, through programmes such as our Agile Nation 2 project run by Juare Teg. We're seeing that with the right training and support, we can help women move into management and into senior 
uh, roles. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier on, the Economic Action Plan uh, will uh, as, uh, be informed by the recommendations that come through from the Fair Work Board. Sean Gwenllian. Mae'n bwysig cofio be yn union ddigwyddodd yn i naw un wyth, wrth gwrs, pan gafodd menywod bleidleisio am y tro cyntaf, ond dyn o ddim cydroddoldeb efo dynion. Roedd dynion 21 yn cael bleidleisio, ond roedd rhaid i fenywod fod yn 30 oed ac yn berchen eiddo. Mi gymerodd i ddeng mlynedd arall cyn i ferched y dynion gael eu trin yn gydradd fel bleidleiswyr. Ac wrth gwrs, dwi siŵr dach chi'n cytuno dan ni'n bell o fod o'r sefyllfa o gydroddoldeb rhwng menywod a dynion yng Nghymru dan ni newydd glywad ynglyn ar gender pay cap, y gap. Um, ydych chi'n cytuno fod adroddiad senedd sy'n gweithio i Gymru sy'n argymell integreiddio cwota rhywedd i'r system etholiadol ar gyfer etholiadau nesaf y'r cynulliad cenedlaethol yn rhywbeth i fynd ar i olo. Um, ac ydych chi'n cytuno, os bydd y cynulliad yn mabwysiadu dull STV, y dalu hi fod yn efynnol drwy gyfraith i bob plaid gyflwyno hanner i hymgeiswyr yn fynywod a'r hanner arall yn ddynion. Dwi ddim yn erbyn hwnna am unig gwydr o gwbl. Mae'n aelod o beth i, I drafod yn luniau STV er enghraifft, a'r ffordd o ethol aelodau'r lle hyn. Mae'r record, well, dwi'n ar, 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 ar llafur Cymru yma, uh, ond uh, mae beth mae'r wedi gweud a dylai ni i styried uh, neu i ddadle a dylai fod yna uh, gyfartaledd uh, rhwng menywod a dynion yn y lle hyn. Fi'n gwybod mae yna yn rhywbeth dylai ni i, I drafod yn yn sicrhau bod y record da sydd wedi bod gyda ni dros y flynyddau yn parhau yn y pen draw. Cwestiwn pimp, Julie Morgan. What assessment has the First Minister made of the impact on Wales of China's decision to ban imports of plastic? Well, I'd refer back to the answers I gave to the previous question, but I can say that our assessment is that Wales has uh, a, a good bit of resilience to the ban because of our policies for high quality recycling. In addition, we are working to get even higher quality and to increase the take up of plastic recycling in Wales, so safeguarding businesses and creating jobs. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. <coughs> I'm sure the First Minister would agree that uh, stopping the use um, of plastic to begin with is the key to cut down on, on any um, exports that were needed. And does he think that one of the ways possibly of doing this is to offer incentives to local authorities to bring back drinking fountains into use? Because if you have um, widely available drinking fountains, that does take away the need for the plastic um, bottles of water that um, many people carry around. So would he think that um, you know, the widespread introduction of, um, of fountains would be a good way to move forward? It's an interesting idea, I have to say. Uh, it's been a long time since there was a drinking fountain that operated in my hometown. In fact, I don't remember it operating, but still there, uh, in my hometown of uh, Opera Gen. I think a lot of people would use uh, drinking fountains if they, were, if they were there. It's not that long ago when the very idea of buying water in a plastic bottle would have seemed very strange to so many of us when it came out of a tap. It wasn't until I lived in London in the, early, uh, in the late 1980s that I realised why people in London would drink uh, bottled water, given the quality of the water that was there, certainly at, uh, at that time. But I think that is an idea that it's worth uh, looking at. Whether there are any legal issues that arise as a result, uh, I don't know. I can't see sensibly why there, why there should be. Uh, but it is something I will, I will take up and, and write to the member further on. Mark Reckless. Uh, is the First Minister confident that the huge volumes of plastic which we have been exported to uh, China have been properly recycled rather than, for instance, sent to landfill? Well, I mean, we know that we cannot keep on, I mean, in terms of what happens in China, that's a matter ultimately for, for, for the Chinese, but they have made it very clear they won't accept any more plastic. I think in the medium to long term, the Chinese ban could help to improve the quality of recyclable materials. It could encourage investment in recycling infrastructure here in Wales and could have a positive effect on the development of a circular economy. The challenge now is there for businesses to see the opportunity that, that now presents uh, itself because it's no longer the case that there is a cheap alternative that makes it difficult for the business model to work. There is now an opportunity to recycle more in Wales and create more jobs in Wales. Simon Thomas. Diolch Llawydd. Dylai fod yn bwfiad cenedlaethol dros bosib bod ni ddim yn allfofio yn gwastraff ac yn benodol bod ni ddim yn allfofio gwastraff plastic. Ie, gostwng y nifer o plastic dyn ni'n defnyddio fel o Julie Morgan yn ogymu, ond pa mae plastic yn cael ei defnyddio, gyda'i ddim siŵr bod ni'n cael ei ail defnyddio hyd yn oed cyn i gael ei ailgylchu. Na mae ail defnyddio yn dibynnu â system 
debyg i'w fath o blaendal a botelu, so fi fath o cynllun dychwelyd uh, blaendal. Mae ma yna cytundeb rhwng uh, ei blaid yntau a, a blaid yna, anglyn a edrych i mewn i hynny yn sgil y uh, gyllideb. Uh, pa fath o fôl y fe yn ei weld a gyfer gytundeb o'r fath ac a gyfer cynllun o'r fath i wneud yn siŵr bod ni'n ail ddefnyddio mwy o plastig? Well, na un peth ygwrs yn uh, byddai'r adroddiad uh, mis nesaf yn ystyried. Am hafa o'r ddallwn ni sicrhau bod mwy o blasig yn cael ei ail gylchu ac ail ddefnyddio. A hefyd, ydych chi'n ymwneud â'r ffordd ydych chi'n sicrhau bod ni'n gallu hybu bobl i sicrhau bod ni'n defnyddio llai o blasig. Y broblem sy'n gwisgo wedi bod gyda'r gynnydd yn gwrs yw bod y rhan fwyaf o'r plasig, mae'r rhan fwyaf o'r gwastraff sydd yn codi yng Nghymru, wedi fas i Gymru. Dwi ddim yn gallu rheolau mewn ynglyn a fel mae pethau'n cael ei lapio. Ni wastu wedi gwybod delio ar y beth beth sy'n dod mewn i Gymru. Ond, dwi yna ddim yn meddwl a allwn ni ddim i ystyried cynlluniau er mwyn lleihau y plastig sydd ddim yn cael ei ail ddefnyddio. A dyna beth bydd y raglen yn edrych arno, a dyna beth bydd y rhodroddiad, a rhan o beth bydd y rhodroddiad yn edrych arno, pan fydd yn cael ei gyhoeddi mis nesaf. Cwestiwn chwech, David Rees. Will the first minister outline the Welsh Government's economic priorities for Aberafon in 2018? Yes, our economic priorities for all parts of Wales, including Aberafon, are set out in prosperity for all economic actors. <laughs> Well, thank you for that answer, First Minister. Now, the Welsh Government obviously has the concept of enterprise zones as one of its important factors in local economic growth. Uh, but the only enterprise zone in South Wales West is actually in Portalbert. It was created as a consequence of the uncertainty of the steel making. And I appreciate the Welsh Government's investment in Portalbert, but there is still uncertainty over the future of the steelworks because of the joint venture, and we don't know the details of that joint venture yet. So there is a need to keep that enterprise zone active and attractive to people. Now, there appears to be a little movement in the enterprise zone at this moment, time to actually in wood investment, seeing jobs come in. But perhaps that could be down to the fact that there's a prison coming to the enterprise zone. Definitely uncertainty there as a need of that. Now, what we want is the Welsh Government to remove that uncertainty. <coughs> and it's easy, because all you have to do is say you are not going to sell the land to the Ministry of Justice, and that uncertainty is removed, and businesses can be looking forward to that enterprise zone as an option. It's important that the industrial and commercial use of that land is, is for the building the local economy and growth and not for a prison. Well, I, I can say to the member that I've received a, a response from the Ministry of Justice to a letter that I sent. The response is not satisfactory, to my mind, uh, and so our position remains the same. We're not in a position to, to sell that land because the response is not uh, satisfactory. I can say, in order to, uh, to assist him, that in terms of uh, Port Talbot, some 37 applications from the Potobot Waterfront were awarded financial support, a total value of £676,000 to help them to offset the cost of uh, business uh, rates. Uh, we have secured enhanced capital allowances for three specific sites within the Waterfront Enterprise uh, Zone in order to boost investment and employment opportunities for the area. And those ECAs will be available in designated areas within Baglan Energy Park, Baglan Industrial Estate and Port Talbot Docks. Question Scythe, Bethan Jenkins. The First Minister outlined Welsh Government policies to end homelessness in Wales. Yes, the Housing Wales Act 2014 has made a substantial and positive difference. There is still work to do. Our commitment to combating homelessness is demonstrated by the priority given to it in prosperity for all. And we've seen significant additional financial investment uh, in terms of uh, dealing with rough sleeping, uh, with housing, with youth homelessness and mental health. Thank you. Um, we uh, noticed as Assembly members that you made an announcement before Christmas of an extra £10 million into youth homelessness um, with the intention to eradicate that in 10 years with £10 million. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a bit more detail on that because I did ask Llamai, who seemed to be the only organisation involved in that announcement, what the detail was and they couldn't give me any more detail. And I also made the effort to contact um, other um, organisations in the homelessness sector who also had uh, no idea as to what uh, your intentions were. So could you outline uh, what they are, especially in the context of the fact that there is an already 10-year uh, programme in place that put what was worked upon with uh, Plaid Cymru as part of the One Wales Government? Um, of course, we're not going to shun uh, the announcement of £10 million, pounds, but we want to know who will be able to apply for those contracts, if it is going to go to general uh, uh, public contract, and how we can scrutinise that money, because, of course, 10 years um, is a long uh, way away, and we would hope that by now we could have actually eradicated youth homelessness? Well, first of all, 10 years seems a long time, but it's what the sector tells us is realistic in terms of ending youth uh, homelessness. As the far as the money is concerned, it will be available to 
any organisation uh, that is able to um, meet the right criteria in order to help uh, to uh, ensure that homelessness is, uh, is eradicated. Uh, but I went to Lamai before Christmas. I spoke to young people particularly who had been helped by Lamai. Lamai is one organisation amongst many, of course. Uh, and it was encouraging to see the work that, uh, that they have been doing, the work that they do. But we want to work with those now in the sector to make sure that that money is put to best use with the shared intention of ending youth homelessness in Wales. Question with David Melding. Will the First Minister make a statement on local authority house building in Wales? Yes, house building in Wales is a key priority for the Government. Local authorities are expecting to build a 1,000 new council homes towards our target of 20,000 affordable homes. We're also protecting existing social housing stock by ending the right to buy. First Minister, I've said uh, from this side of the House we would support uh, uh, the, uh, the move to local authorities building uh, social housing uh, once more if that was thought to be a strategic way of improving the level of house building. Uh, just 16 homes were completed last year in the local authorities sector, 13 of those in one authority, Flincher. So if they are going to become major builders, uh, they will need to uh, uh, improve their capacities and skills in this area, and that needs to be considered now because we face a 15, 20-year crisis if we don't start building many, many more homes. Well, of course, uh, council, council housing is something that we want to encourage. We've done that financially. It doesn't mean they can plug all the gap themselves, but it's hugely important that they're able to uh, make provision in their local area. I was with the member of Swan East, uh, Mike Hedges, uh, recently, uh, and I saw uh, for myself the good work of uh, Swansea uh, Council uh, in the uh, money there with the area of uh, his uh, constituency. Cardiff Council are developing 543 affordable new uh, homes under their housing partnership programme. I know that Ennis Morn plan to build 198 new council homes over the next five years. Flincher uh, is uh, moving forward with developing 200 new uh, council uh, homes. And Kamalja, uh, just to make sure that everybody knows they're not picking on certain councils run by certain parties, uh, through their affordable homes delivery plan, do intend to provide over 60 new council homes over the next two years, in addition, of course, to the uh, work that be, that's been done in Swansea. Diolch i'r prif wynidog. Yr eitem nesaf felly yw'r datganiad.